everybody. Happy Wednesday. I'm so excited to have you here with me and happy October. Um, I can't believe it is fall. It is giving season. I made a wreath this past weekend and put a fall wreath and we have pumpkins outside. Halloween dec decorations are coming up. Um, so I'd love to know today while you're watching um, what fall festivities are you actively a part of? Have you gone to the pumpkin patches? Um, are you picking apples if you're up north? How do you get into the fall mood? I love this time of year. It is semi kind of getting cooler in Atlanta. I feel like it's this fall trick where it's like a fake fall <laughs> is what we're going through right now. Um, but anyways, I love to make these as interactive as possible. If we have not met before, my name is Dana Snyder, and I am the CEO and founder of Positive Equation, and I host the edition live where I get to chat with pretty amazing people in the nonprofit sector um, about digital marketing and thought leadership and fundraising and all the things. And through my company, I focus on really helping nonprofit marketers amplify the work they're doing, thrive, and raise more funds online. And so today we have a special treat to talk to Julie Ordonez. She might help me if I did that right. Did I do that right, Julie? I can see her backstage. She's giving me thumbs up. Okay, good. <laughs> she can come back on and critique me on rolling my R's. Um, but I wanted to firstly state as we're going into giving season, I love tech platforms. I think anybody who knows me knows this. Give Butter is one of my partners. Um, I adore them and what they provide to nonprofit organizations. And they really help nonprofits raise funds, track your progress, help you run virtual events, engage your supporters. They have a full suite of things that is brand new um, that really gives you everything you need. And the key is it's completely free. So let's take a quick look at their recent product updates. <laughs> Okay, I hope if anything, that music woke you up uh, this afternoon or this morning, wherever you are. I love all of the fun features that they have going on in their branding. They have worked with over 35,000 causes, you guys, and raised over $150 million in just the past 18 months. It's incredible. If you're interested, check out the link that is in the caption. Wherever you are watching, um, there's a link to check out Give Butter. Um, and today, talking about fundraising, I'm really excited to have Julie here with us. She is an executive fundraising coach, and we're going to be talking about how to prioritize individual giving, raising those five and six figure gifts without asking. So to back up, give you some insights about Julie. She's a former top 1% performer at United Way of Greater Los Angeles. Shout out to my LA community and development director at a national anti-poverty organization. Currently, she really helps ambitious nonprofit leaders get the courage, love that, and strategy to ask for more and raise more of those five, six, and seven-figure gifts inside her group coaching accelerator, The Courage Lab. So without further ado, hey, Julie. Hi, <laughs> here we are. Hi, Dana, thanks for having me. We have been long term, long time Instagram follower friends, yeah. and it's actually been interesting. I think during the pandemic, I feel like I have connected with so many more people than before because we've been kind of like forced to be virtual. And so I'm noticing like all the amazing female founders and entrepreneurs in this space. 
Um, so thank you for being here. I'm glad that I follow you and get to see all of your amazing content all the time. Thank you so much for having me. I'm so happy to be here. Yeah, let's go ahead and dive into it. So um, where did you, because I feel like we all have this in the nonprofit sector, right? Like where did you find your passion and really your interest for getting into the space? Yeah, I uh, was raised in Houston, Texas and uh, by a really um, spiritual family who went to church every week and we volunteered a lot. And I was actually raised United Methodist, if anyone's familiar with that denomination, where yeah. it's founded by John Wesley, who was all about service and really, you know, faith is dead without works, without putting it into action. And so I was really raised in that environment. I'd go to summer camp and we would not be jumping in a lake. We would be re renovating people's houses. We would yep. be um, painting and building wheelchair ramps for people who didn't have to, who weren't able to get in and out of their homes. I did the um, same thing. That's so funny, Dana. Oh my gosh. And so I love that. And, and so for me, volunteering was just something that you did. And I didn't realize till later how weird that was, um, you know, like as an adult seeing that this is not something that everyone does. This is not normal. And I knew even when I was in um, college that I wanted to work for a nonprofit. I got my degree in communication and Spanish and Latin American studies. And sadly, I am no longer fluent. Um, but I was fluent in Spanish <laughs> at one point in my life, and I am ashamed. Um, anyway, but um, yeah, I I knew I loved volunteering. I'm very action oriented. I love to be active and helping people. So and inspiring other people to take action. And uh, I was dating a guy who I fell in love with and he moved out to Los Angeles to pursue a career in television. And that's what he does now. And, uh, I moved out here a little while after that, even though I said that I hated LA and that I would never live here. <laughs> Isn't that fun? And now I've lived here for, uh, what, 13 years. So yeah, I, I, um, I needed you a job. Braved it through the pandemic. I left. Yeah. Oh, you did. And you're, now you're in Atlanta, which yeah. so many people are moving to Atlanta. You know, it's got it going the on. Hollywood of the East. There you go. That's exactly right. So, yeah, I, I got a, my first nonprofit fundraising job here in L.A. I really loved it. Um, I took a fundraising job. I didn't even know fundraising was a full time job. And I needed a job. And I did it. And I had a mentor who said, I think you would be really good at this. And I just took the leap nice. and I was good at it. And I really liked it. I enjoyed building relationships with people. Um, back then I was a generalist, you know, I was doing, I was a one person shop and I was doing everything. I was updating the website. I was writing press releases. Shout out to anybody else who's doing it all. <laughs> right. And that was me. I was doing all the individual giving. I was calling donors. I was doing corporate sponsorships. I was writing all the grants and letters of inquiry. I was running the gala that we had every year and coordinating silent auction items and managing yeah. interns and been there. You know, that was my first gig. Yeah. Um, and I, I really loved it. I mean, it was super stressful, uh, <laughs> uh, but I loved it. Yeah. So that's how I got into it. Amazing. So when I think, it's so interesting. I feel like we have such parallel paths in mm. growing up doing mission trips um, and mission work um, through also mine was through church growing up and then started yeah. to just do that on my own. Um, and I think that leads so well into then there's always been this path of generosity mm. that you've had, right? Whether it's been through your mission work as a kid and then leaning into your jobs in Los Angeles so something that I read in your bio is your signature program, the Courage Lab. So there's something I read on your website that really like mm -hmm. caught my eye and you speak about the keys to a culture of generosity. Yeah. Can you explain what you mean by that? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Great question, Dana. Um, yes. So what I mean 
I think a lot of leaders, they come um, to people like you or me, right? Or there's so many amazing experts out there. And they're like, look, we need to raise more money. We've got more people we need to serve in our program. They're on the wait list. We need to hire more staff. We need to grow, right? And so they come to us for those reasons. And what's really going on behind the scenes, what is the root cause of why they're not fully funded is because of the culture. There is not a culture that is conducive to people giving a lot of money. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Just plainly put. Yeah. There is a culture where you have made it hard for people to give you money. And there are many, many valid reasons for this, right? A lot of it is unintentional. We get bogged down doing things we hate. We're not in our strengths. Um, and so we move a lot slower. It feels laborious because it is. And we're, we convince ourselves that we must do the things that we hate to do, that this is supposed to be a slog, that we're supposed to work you know, till 2 a.m. And, oh, and burn ourselves out. And this actually keeps us um, really low energy, very, we, we work really, really hard and produce very little results. Yeah. And I think that the nonprofit sector overall is not very strategic and they're not owning their genius. And a big part of so building good. a culture of generosity is, is you have to be willing to humble yourself and do the things that you're really good at. And I think courage is, is rooted in humility. Courage is saying, I am willing to do the thing that scares me or that is risky um, because I'm doing it on behalf of others in service to others, right? That's what ultimate courage yeah. is. And so it's, it's actually rooted in humility because it's not self-focused, right? Humility is about focusing on others. And so many times we're self-focused in the sense that we have to, this has to be painful. We, we must suffer in order to prove that we, we're so backwards success, or that we, we've just convinced ourselves that it's just got to be so painful to raise money and to grow our mission and our programs. And I would submit that you're going to see, you're going to build a culture of generosity when you are stepping into humility, you're owning your genius and your strengths, your unique strengths. There are things that only Dana Snyder can do, right? And you have to, to own what that is and step into it fully. And Thanks, when Julie. You, yeah, it's true. And when you true. do, you, you, you unlock creativity, you unlock yeah. solutions that you didn't see was there. You feel free to fully be yourself and you can raise money and communicate with your donors and with your volunteers and people on your team in the unique way that you want to do it. Right. And we end up doing the things that we want to do. Yeah. Right. So that's the best strategy is what's the stuff you want to do? Do that. And and I think we we struggle with building a culture of generosity where people are just inspired to give. And so they give spontaneous gifts that are above and beyond what we anticipated they would even give. Right. You right. might be thinking, oh, this person could probably give ten thousand dollars. That's what my gut is saying. But if you work on building a culture that is rooted in gratitude, that's rooted in humility, that you're communicating really well and often, and you're owning your genius, you will receive your, your internal fundraising goals will become irrelevant because people will start to spontaneously give above and beyond even what you were planning on asking them for. I love that. Something that, man, there's so many nuggets in there that I just want to pull out. I think what's interesting about our space, and I think this kind of goes back to even the interview process mm. of when someone gets brought on for a team is asking those questions. Something that um, in my mastermind group that I'm a part of, she asks mm -hmm. our Enneagram and she asks these very like intimate personality questions to understand mm -hmm. like, how do we think? How do we process things? How yeah. should we, therefore, how are we going to receive criticism? Um, and 
Yes. I love focusing on your strengths and really understanding like part of that is like time management. Where are you spending your time? What should you not be spending your time on? That's I've done that this year. This also goes into the entrepreneurship space too, right? Like everything you're talking about can be for the for-profit industry too. So That's us as fellow founders, I had to go through this activity with myself earlier this year. That's spot on. And I was like, I could, I can do this thing, but should I be spending my time doing this? Bingo. That's right. And a lot of leaders that I talk to, founders, EDs, CEOs, heads of fundraising, they say, I ask them, scale of zero to 10 on an average week, um, how, how much of your time is spent doing what you are really strong at? You know, 10 being... I'm in my strengths every day and I possibly couldn't be in my strengths any more than I already am. And a lot of people say five, four on, maybe I hear a six, seven, Yeah. you know, and these, and, and, and as long as we stay in that place and we, we refuse to outsource, we refuse to go, we refuse to delegate, we refuse to empower people to fail and learn like you learned and failed. Hello. 100%. Right. Then we, we won't raise more money because there are, there's no level of growth where an ED or a founder is going to stop fundraising. There's no level of growth where where we cannot prioritize individuals. Yeah. And I think the a big challenge for fundraisers and for EDs and founders is, you know, I, I don't have time, right? Like you mentioned time and believing that in order to raise five, six, and even seven figure gifts, it's going to take four hours a day, every day for months and months. And this is just a completely, it's a made up. I don't know who's saying that, but it ain't true. You know, yeah. it's, I, what I teach in Courage Lab and in my one-on-one um, fundraising coaching is you can do this in 10 to 15 minutes a day. And I help people to build a customized communication system, right? Again, that's rooted in their strengths, that is strengths-based so that it, it becomes totally manageable and people get results within weeks and a few months, you know, where donors are, that. wow, nobody has ever had a client who, who, sent a a really beautiful, heartfelt, personalized email, one email to a longtime volunteer who has been donating pro bono work, right? Very, very invested person in the mission. And just said, hey, you know what, Dana, you have given so much of the time. You have gone above and beyond. I can tell that you deeply care about this. And I just want to communicate to you. We we haven't done a good job of this but we're going to do better moving forward. Here is how you have helped us to change lives. And that volunteer said, wow, no nonprofit has ever communicated the impact in this way. Here's $10,000. Wow. And so that happens to my clients all the time. I, I love to see that happen because it, it changes the mind of the nonprofit leader. You don't even have to ask someone if you just do a really good job of building relationships, you will see how it is a joy for people to give to your mission. 100%. I love this. I'm going to, I'm going to go into a tactical question, but first I think what's interesting about that is it made the organization top of mind also. Again, Mm. when we think about going to the store and the products we're going to buy, I go for the same, usually the same type of like brands all the time because they're top Mm -hmm. of mind in marketing or advertising. And so if you're sending like those personalized communications, um, and I recently became a donor, a monthly recurring donor for three organizations. And it's been very interesting. I feel like a secret shopper. (laughs) (laughs) I love it. (laughs) Because I'm kind of analyzing what they're sending to me. Sure. Um, And so it's really interesting. So I... I want to get your insights because we are at the beginning of giving season. Um, Yeah. And you work with a ton of fundraisers and development teams. 
when it comes to individual giving and you kind of sneaked at this, what do you think they should really be focused on? Like right now, like beginning of October? Yep. Yeah. So something, uh, we did encourage lab, uh, my group coaching accelerator this week, we talked about goals. So identify what your goal is. What is your number goal? What, what do you need to get to? What would you like to get to? You know, let's say that that's $250,000. You need to, and this literally takes five minutes, sit down and write out the names of the people who you think are going to get you to $250,000. It's probably around 10 people, if you're honest. So these people could be your most loyal volunteers. I don't care if they've given you $500 or $1,000 in the past. These people could be people who've given you 50K in the past. So there's a lot of different ways to get to $250,000, right? Um, I picked a complicated number, but that's, (laughs) I should have picked 100K. Let's say it's 100K. That's 10 people giving you 10K. That's two people giving you 50K. My personal favorite, one person giving you 100K. So there are lots of different ways to get there. And we think that because we have an email list that is 3000 people, or we have all these Instagram followers, we have all these people on Facebook, we're thinking about all these different platforms and we're looking at achieving our goal in a completely different way. When it comes to end of year giving, the people who are going to get you to your goal are your most passionate people who this mission to them is deeply personal. They yeah. are on your team. They have your back. When you need emergency funds or you need some sort of, you know, you need lighting for your play production, you need, you know, whatever it is, right? They're there and they show up, those people. And we need to do a good job of communicating to them how they have helped you to get where you are. And it needs to be deeply personal, like you would talk to a dear friend who has helped you in your time of need. 100%. And, and those people are the ones you really need to focus on. So let's yeah. say you've got 10 to 12 people who are going to help you get to $250,000. Then between now and the end of the year, you need to write, what, write 12 emails and have 12 meetings. This is very doable in three months. So we need to bring focus to our efforts rather than feel like we got to boil the whole damn ocean. Yep. It ain't going to happen like that. If you really think about it, okay, I got to meet my goal. Who's going to help me get there? That's where you focus your time and energy. And it will bring such a sense of relief that you don't have to reach out to everybody and their brother. You know, it really is about the people who have the highest capacity and really even more than that, who have the highest passion for your mission and are on your team. That's amazing. I love it. Did everybody get that? (laughs) Dare we write that down? This is this is like game changing stuff right here. I am going to watch this back and take notes. Comment below with your questions if you are watching, if you are prepping for giving season. You have the lovely Julie right now that can help answer your fundraising questions. She is a gem of an expert in this space. Um, my next question for you is near and dear to my heart because I am one a millennial. Um, so when it comes to, and of course I do a lot of online fundraising, right? Yes. When it comes to millennials and Gen Z donors, yep. what do you see happening in the space as far as getting them interested into your organization? How are they donating? Like, how do you think their involvement is really evolving overall? Yep. Uh, it's a great question. So I too am a millennial. I'm 34 years old. I would say that Um, right now we are in a really interesting time in history where we're really isolated and people are really lonely. Um, I think I saw a stat about Gen Z that they're like the loneliest generation and there there's just crippling comparison with social media, the feeling of like hopelessness, suicide rates, yeah, are up amongst that generation. I think that nonprofits have a moral responsibility to communicate ways in which millennials and Gen Z can actually find meaning and purpose mm. beyond their own dreams, 
beyond being self-focused, frankly. And I wouldn't even necessarily limit that to millennials and Gen Z, but I think that um, rather than seeing it as this tremendous obstacle, I see it as an opportunity and I see nonprofit leaders as the ones who can really step in and, and like cultivate that community to bring them together. Yeah. Right. And build relationships. And I think that our communication and our tactics should be highly personalized and engaging and relationship and impact focused. Um, and, and that that's, you know, Gen Z and millennials are, are very conscious of our planet, really conscious consumers yep. care deeply about long-term impacts of their consumerism you know, people are making big changes that I think Gen X and and boomers weren't making. And so I think there's, I see it as a tremendous opportunity. Yeah. Um, and and a lot of the work that I teach and, and what I, I teach my clients is to be highly personalized. Um, and, yeah. and I think that it works because it's just the right thing to do also. Like, yeah. it's, it's more fun to get to know people and be curious about them. And and if you look at, I always look at the, what's the for-profit space doing when Mm. they're trying to advertise to our generation. And, Mm. and I do see your question, Amy, I will put it up here in a second. Um, Is everything has been personalized. Like all the quizzes we take for customized hair products or makeup products um, to get an email address. So something is curated specifically That's for right. you, right? Like take, I always look at, oh, what was that? Subscription boxes, right? Like close yep. to half of women in the U S subscribe to a, some sort of subscription box because we, we expect personalization, right? Yes. I open up Netflix. I want to see what they recommend. Cause I've seen it all, Dana. Yeah. I need the recommendations. <laughs> Squid Games? Are you watching Squid Games? Because it's crazy. I I am watching Squid Game. And my husband and I, we really watch a lot of dark stuff. And this is, it's so, spoiler alert, it's so murderous. I cannot believe how popular this show is given how extremely violent it is. It is crazy. Okay, we got got questions coming in. I love it. If anybody hasn't, hasn't watched it, put it on and you're either going to be like, whoa. No. But apparently... It has blown, this is such a tangent, it's blown Bridgerton out as far as like most watched show ever on Netflix, just saying. All right, wow. Amy, um, she understands focusing on personal communication uh, for a significant list of people who are passionate about your organization, but what about general communication is worth doing for end of year? Yeah, this is great. So I'm sure you also have thoughts on this, Dana. I think segmenting your list is really important. And I would say you've got to decide who you really want to build relationships with and, you know, who is just going to receive a more generic pitch from you. Um, You know, write up a, I have a proven pitch framework and that I work with my clients and help them to build their customized pitch, but it's basically showing gratitude being able to communicate the impact of what their previous giving has done succinctly, right? Yes. So last year, you helped us to serve 250 youth in a holistic way by providing housing, after school care, whatever it is, right? And then being able to say, here is our vision for how we will be moving forward. Mm-hmm. Is it you're going to serve 300 youth now? Are you going to be serving the same 250 youth in a deeper way? Are you adding a new program to serve them holistically? So are you going wider? Are you going deeper? Are you doing both? What does growth look like in your vision? And then inviting them to be a part of that. Hey, last year, you know, you could segment your list to be people who gave between $5 and $1,500. And you could say, Hey, last year you gave this amount, right? You could run this through an Excel spreadsheet. This would take you one afternoon. And would you consider giving 20% more than you did last year? And even if half of the people on your list respond with yes, that is a massive win. You're getting 20% more than you did the year prior from those people who've already been giving to you. 
And you could do that with one email. That's something that I help my clients yeah. with. And that way you're inviting people to give, um, but you don't feel the need to have a meeting one-on-one -on -one with everybody or to reach out to them in all of these different channels. If you really make the email highly personalized, succinct, powerful, you tell a quick story, you include photos. I think, I think that will go a very long way. Love that. Um, Amy on the digital side, one of my like tricks, not really a trick, but something I love to do for communication is sending, um, you can template them, but like personalized DMS on Instagram. So to your followers on Instagram, you can have a similar message and tweak it a little bit per person. So that it does feel personalized, or you can even do this during a voice DM. So you can send them, which blows people's mind. And it could just be a touch in towards the end of the year. Like, Hey, thank you so much for being a follower and supporter. This is kind of what we've got going on. We'd love to hear about the impact the organization's had for you. Boom. And people be like, oh my gosh, wow. Thank you so much for reaching out. Um, that's one. Another recent, and I see other questions coming through here that I'll get to. Another really interesting organization talked about this on a podcast was like their goal is for their nonprofit to no longer exist, right? Because they're going to solve the problem that they were created for. So if you can showcase, like, where are you? Like, where are you in that path? If you're close, then that's like a really big, relevant key to urgency that you can speak to in communication. Um, I think that's, I think that could be a fun one. Um, this organization, unfortunately, I can't see your face on here, but I'm a founder of a small nonprofit where I'm doing a lot on my own. Shout out, giving you props. I definitely need to cultivate relationships more throughout the year. We have reached our financial goals. Congratulations this year. So would you suggest holding off on giving season? Ask until maybe next year when we've done more work in the donor cultivation area. Thoughts, Julie? Uh, holding off on a giving season ask. No, I would not uh, do that. <laughs> um, <laughs> just to answer, in succinct. I'll explain why. Um, I think that when we become so focused on our own goals that we are actually um, saying no for people and them experiencing purpose and meaning and joy in their life through giving. Uh, so I don't want you to be so self-focused on your internal goals that you miss out on the opportunity to invite people to be a part of what you're doing. And uh, giving is a way that people will feel like a part of your team and be more bought in literally. So you don't just ask people to give because of your goals. You ask them to give because you yes. are leading them into a greater life of generosity. It's a much higher calling than just raising money to pay the bills. That's such so a good mindset shift. My, my invitation to you lovely Facebook user that is an amazing founder of a small nonprofit is to change the way that you think of yourself, that you are a leader in your donor's life and that you're, you're calling your responsibility is to invite them into the, the most generous version of themselves. Woo. Take it. Julie's on the pulpit. That's right, baby. I'm here for <laughs> I got you back. I love it. That's amazing. All right, Amy. And then I'm this last question. I'm going to switch into my final question. But Amy, I'm so glad you're here watching on LinkedIn. Shout out. I think we've had Facebook, a YouTube question, and a LinkedIn. I love it. Um, this has been so informative. Good. I'm so glad. Yay. She is one of those one women shows. Yes. Can you explain a bit about how to request a meeting with an existing or prospective donor? Should the CEO be at the meeting? Also. Yeah. Hi, Amy. Thank you for your great question. Um, so I am assuming that you are the head of fundraising here because you have a CEO. So, and you're probably the only person in development. Um, so I think something that's, it's an opportunity for you to really manage up and delegate to your CEO and take the ownership of, of the both of you meeting your fundraising goals and create portfolios. So that would be my recommendation. There may be some donors who both of you should meet with, um, and that's great. And you can strategize and make that suggestion to your CEO. But I want you to be confident 
in the responsibility and in your role in the organization. You have been given this responsibility on purpose and for a purpose. It is not an accident. And I don't want you to assume that everybody would rather meet with your CEO. That is not true. Mm. I want you to assume that people want to hear from you, that they are excited to learn more about how they can be involved and change lives, and that you are the one to step into that moment and extend an invitation for them to change lives. That's the purpose of the meeting. And so when you think about it that way, you're, when you give your donors the benefit of the doubt, when you believe in them and you have faith in them and in yourself, you will move forward and you will be able to request meetings. It will become very clear how to do that. Um, but I'll just give you a really quick uh, synopsis of an email. It needs to be straight to the point and it needs to be, hey, you've been giving for X number of years and I'm new to the organization or I'm new in the role or we are prioritizing our most loyal donors. And I would love to meet with you to get to know you better and to understand why you give and to report back to you the difference that you have made in your giving and in lives changed. When is a good time for you? Here is a link to my calendar for a 20 minute chat. So you're saying when is a good time, not let me know when you're free. Ah! And then, you know, you're, that just sets you yourself up for disappointment. Um, yeah. no, you know, they're not going to let you know. There's lots of priorities. There's lots of things on their plate. So use the phrase, when would be a good time for you? And use Calendly, use any sort of automation system where you can set up 20 minute Zoom calls. Um, if where you are is meeting in person, great. I would clarify the amount of time that you're requesting of them. And and the purpose of it, just to get right to it. Don't feel like you need to throw up all of this information about your nonprofit in the email. Expect right. that you will meet with this person and be very succinct in your email and you will get a better engagement rate. Yeah, short and to the point. That's right. Totally agree. And this is a great follow-up question to this. So for those people that do or are planning virtual Zoom meetings. You recently had a blog post about arranging a donor meeting on Zoom um, that I loved. So obviously there's a difference between when you're in person and when you're virtual. So what are some of your success tips for managing a really good virtual ask? Yeah, that's great. So as you can see, I'm looking at the camera, right? And Dana, your face is down here. <laughs> <laughs> but I'm choosing to look at the camera because I, not for me, it's for you and for everybody watching. It appears as though I'm giving you direct feedback. So number one tip, you are going to need to get comfortable pretending like your camera lens is a human being. So I, let's just do a quick, I'm, I'm going to bring you full screen. Yeah. Right? Let's do a difference of, okay, you looking at the camera. Yes, I'm looking at the camera. Okay, and then you looking down towards where the, oh, that's a big difference. Yeah, it's not as engaging. No, um, right. And if I care about looking at how, I want to see how I look, I want to see you, I want to see your reaction, we have to listen with our ears and look here at the camera because eye contact makes a huge difference. And we need that right now. We've been going through a global pandemic. Didn't you hear? And we, we, need, we need connection. We need yeah. connection. And so you need to make the effort, look in the camera. I know it's weird. Get over it. Boo-hoo. Big deal. We got to do it. So look in the camera because again, you're, you're serving this person. Ask powerful questions. I want, when you get into a meeting, I want you to, to center your meeting around a specific question that you want to get to know, you want to understand. So it could be, you know what, Dana, you've been giving for five years faithfully to our organization. Why do you do that? You could give anywhere. Right. You no, know, there are lots of dog shelters in this, in the nation and even in, in Georgia, right? But you decide to give to ours. You see, there's humility and gratitude in that. I'm not taking for granted. I'm not entitled to Dana's gift when I, you see, all of that is implied in the question. We love people who are humble. We find them more attractive. 
we're, we, it's more of a magnetic spirit. And your guard releases. Correct. And so then Dana is all of a sudden feels honored. She says, oh, well, I think what you do is amazing. And the reason I give to you is this, this, and this. You will dispel whatever preconceived notion you have about why this donor gives when you ask powerful questions and you shut up and you listen, (laughs) you know, you have to listen to people. So, and you have to genuinely be curious. If you think you already know all of the answers, then why the heck are you meeting with this person? Yeah. Right. It, we have to be genuinely curious. So when some, the re, the purpose behind asking someone, why do they give is because when you understand, they tell you, well, the reason why is because I give to, to your organization because my sister was a bone marrow transplant donor. And so I want to make sure that, that, other people who have gone through what my family went through has the support that they need. When you hear your donor say that to you, now you understand that this is deeply personal. This is not about a tax write-off alone. This is not because their friend asked them to give to your gala. This is because it's deeply personal. And then when you have that information, all of the communication that follows with them through the rest of the year, you keep that in mind. I never forgot what you said, Dana, about your sister, about how she was a bone marrow transplant donor, about the impact that that had on your family. And I just want you to know that I appreciate your friendship, your generosity, and your loyalty to us. That is so important. Because when you do have those conversations, if you have that conversation and they go back into the cycle of receiving your standard email communication and they just opened up that incredibly emotional piece of information, then it seems like you weren't listening at all. Huh? And, and we do that too much, you know, and we've got to be intentional with people and again, narrow our focus so that we're going deeper with the right people. Um, I think there's a tremendous opportunity there. So for great meetings, look in the camera, ask powerful questions, come prepared with questions and be really clear up front with your purpose for the meeting. Just tell them, I'm not going to ask you for anything this meeting. I honestly, truly want to get to know you. And I want to report back to you all of the wins and the challenges that we've had this last quarter and what our vision is for the future. Um, Amazing. You know, you can just tell them if it is about an ask, you could say, I want to talk to you about your giving. Just straight up say it. Yeah. Be clear. They'll be like, okay, great. It, it's the worst part of it is this little dance that we do, this, th- these games we play. Well, oh, you want to meet with me? Don't know what it's about. Going to stay. I'm going to be. Yeah. I think you always set the expectations of what the conversation is. For sure. It's going to be about um, no, you can just straight up say, hey, Dana, I know that you like to give in December. I'd love to set up a 20 minute Zoom meeting with you to talk about your giving this year. Yeah, I'd love That's to also is. a great nugget. If you can segment your audience, look at when historically they've given what months there might also be something to that. Right. Is is one of those months their birthday? that you haven't asked before, right? If it's December, likely probably end of year giving. But if it's a, it's a, like another month, it could be you have that conversation and something happened to a family member that month and it's an annual remembrance, right? You might not know these things until you have those conversations. Um, my, my only add to the virtual side, um, and Julie would love your thoughts, is of course I go to the tech perspective. <laughs> um, have good internet connectivity, please have a good webcam. They want to see you clearly have a good audio, have a good microphone, like invest in these things so that when you do get on the call, those are not even like, it will not fail you, right? You at least want your setup to be professional so that you can focus on the heartfelt conversation and not technology. That's great. That would be my only add to that. Um, Julie, this has been incredible. I could talk to you 
forever about these things. We need to do another yeah. session. Yeah. Um, I've had so much fun. What's the best people? I know there's like more questions coming in. How can people contact you? Yeah. So I love to hang out on LinkedIn and Instagram. Those are my favorite corners of the internet. Um, I am at Julie M. Ordonez on Instagram. And my website is julieordonez.com. O-R-D-O-N-E-Z. You can see that here. My name is spelled for you. I will put it um, in the comment section, everybody. Boom. There it goes. Yay. That's me. Amazing. Julie, this is awesome. Thank you so much. Um, I appreciate you. you and your time and all of your wisdom. And thank you everyone for tuning in. And I hope to have you back on here really soon. Woohoo! Let's do it. Thanks <laughs> so much, Nina. Thanks, Julie. That was amazing. Um, if you are working on your fundraising, um, please comment, please reach out to Julie, ask us questions. We want to be in community with you and talk to you and communicate and understand what you're working on um, so that we can help and have the best giving season ever. Um, next week, I have two kind of like free workshops happening. One is on Tuesday. Um, these are both on my website. One is going to be around Facebook and Instagram ads. And yes, I will address the elephant in the room of what's been happening with Facebook and everything in the news. The second one is really fun and exciting. This is for my nonprofit and for-profit people. Um, I will put it on. It's on thought leadership and brand identity. So I'm bringing in one of my favorite people, um, Brie Ramos. She also, I'm putting it in the chat right now in the comment section. Um, it's on building your personal brand identity and really distinguishing yourself as a thought leader. She runs a company called the buzz brand. And so this is going to like be a sneak peek into my mastermind program and what a guest coaching session looks like. Uh, Julie is about to get her invite to be a guest coach. <laughs> she just doesn't know it yet. Um, but so this session, it's about 60 minutes. It's a happy hour one. So bring your beverage of choice. I'll probably be having a cab. Um, and listening to Brie on some really great nuggets on how to build up your personal brand identity and thought leadership. So grab a friend. This is for my female leaders out there. Grab a friend, um, come together. We're going to have some fun, some be a lighthearted session, hopefully leave you with some powerful pieces of information. So with that, um, thank you to Give Butter for sponsoring this session. And I will see you in the next live coming up on October 20th. Um, and that is going to be a really fun one talking about how to use digital tech for good. So I'll see you then. Hope everybody has a great rest of the week.